great to see so many of my friends from Iowa. Lana Ross, our executive director for Iowa Community Action, and who owes me a lemon meringue pie, and uh, all of the group here from Iowa who do such a great job for us in Iowa. And let me just say again a word about my friend David Bradley. I can't tell you how important it is for an association to have a strong and experienced and effective representation on Capitol Hill. There's an old expression we use uh, in the Appropriations Committee. Uh, if you're uh, not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, <laughs> well, I can assure you David is always at the table. He has earned tremendous respect on both sides of the aisle and in both houses, and that's how you get things done around here. So at this time when uh, we're under assault, you couldn't ask for a better leader and head of your group than David Bradley, and I just want, David, for you to know how much I appreciate your strength and your commitment and your always being in the front of the fight. Thank you very much, David. Well, as chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee that funds health and education and labor, social service programs, I'm supposed to be like a parent who doesn't play favorites with his children. But when it comes to community services block grants, that idea pretty much goes out the window. Uh, you know, I've appeared here every year and I come here every year because I like to be here. I feel like I'm just a member of your family. And in preparing for that, thinking about this speech, I was thinking about a very emotional and uplifting experience I had uh, just this past weekend. Uh, John Lewis had been on me for some time to come down to Selma, Alabama and to reenact the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on that bloody Sunday of March 9th, 1965. And uh, you know, there's always something going on. So finally this year I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go. So I went down there with uh, John Lewis. There were some other congressmen, Congressman Hoyer and others were there. Uh, and then we watched the movies of that bloody Sunday on March the 9th of 1965. And here was John Lewis at the head of about 30 people at coming across the bridge very peacefully on the sidewalk. He was right on the point. And then to see all these uh, Sheriff Clark's uh, police and posse, what Sheriff Clark had done, had gone out and deputized all these Klansmen and stuff, made them deputies and gave them clubs. And then to watch the charge and watch them beat up John Lewis and so many of these other people and, and drive them all the way back to the Brown AME Church. So we reenacted that march uh, this Sunday. And, uh, and that what happened on that bloody Sunday really opened Americans' eyes, I think, to the viciousness and the ugly face of Jim Crow and racial discrimination. So as you can see, for me, it was a very emotional weekend. Well, what's that got to do with you? Well, I feel a very direct connection this morning between the amazing people who marched in the 1960s and the folks in this room. People who have dedicated your lives to carrying forward the fight for economic justice and opportunity in our own day. In so many ways, every day out there when you stick up for poor people and you stick up for economic and social justice, you're crossing that Edmund Pettus Bridge every day for poor people in this country. <laughs> Let me just be very clear. Because of the great work you do, you are falling directly in those footsteps of those who fought for civil rights and economic justice in the 1960s, and I love you for it. David mentioned that in addition to chairing the key appropriations committee, I also chair the authorizing committee on labor, health, pensions, health, education, and labor pensions. I love this committee. It's always been down through the years when Senator Kennedy chaired it a powerhouse of progressive legislation, including the new health reform law. Someone once said that the Armed Services Committee, the Defense uh, Committee, is the committee that defends America. But the committee I chair is the committee that defines America. And I...
And I want America to be defined as a great and compassionate nation where every citizen has access to quality, affordable health coverage, a nation that provides a safety net for our most vulnerable citizens, a quality public education so they can realize their full potential, a nation that recognizes the inherent right of everyone to a decent job, as well as the right to join a union and to bargain for better, fairer workplaces. I reminded some people this weekend when I was down in Selma and I was asked to speak that, you know, uh, people tend to forget, but that famous march on Washington when the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. gave that famous I Have a Dream speech, you know what that was officially called? It was the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And don't forget that when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, what was he doing in Memphis, Tennessee? He was there to help garbage workers organize a union and get better jobs and better pay. That too must be our cause today. Well, here it is March, you're here in Washington. Washington always gets prettier around this time of the year. The, the uh, cherry blossoms have come out and it gets kind of pretty around here. It's also budget time, which means it gets uglier and uglier at this time of the year. As you know, last month the House passed H.R. 1, their budget bill, to fund the government for the rest of 2011. And make no mistake, this is a pure Tea Party budget bill. It's an abomination that cuts the heart out of the safety net and the ladder of opportunity in America. Include, need I say, savage cuts to community services block grant. Well, they passed it. Yesterday it came to the Senate, and we drove a stake through the heart of H.R. 1. However, <laughs> that is not the end of the story. They're going to be back. The House is still demanding all the cuts. They're threatening to shut the government down if we don't go along with it. Well, so they're going to be back. They're demanding that we slash, what, $305 million from CSBG, a 44% cut in the program this year. That's for the remainder of this year. It would require the termination of dozens of community action agencies nationwide, including the Red Rock Community Action Agency that serves my hometown in Iowa. I come from a town of 150 people. Big town. 150 people, very low income. Um, actually, in the last census, my town of Cumming went from 150 to 180, which now makes it the fifth fastest growing community in the state of Iowa. <laughs> so make no mistake, as far as the Tea Party contingent in the House is concerned, this is a warm-up exercise, and they'll be back for more. And I'm going to be very frank with you. I'm sorry to say that President Obama's budget in 2012 cut CSBG in half. He's my president. He's my friend, he served on my committee, but he's wrong. This is a mistake. This is a mistake, a terrible mistake, and I can assure you that with my position in the Senate, I will not permit it to pass the United States Senate. We've seen this movie before. It's the same old conservative script. Give tax breaks to the wealthiest, then balance the budget on the backs of middle class and the most disadvantaged people in our country. To put it mildly, these are bad priorities, they're bad policies, and they're bad values. You know, a budget is not just a bunch of numbers. A budget speaks to our values, our hopes, our aspirations. 
And in that regard, the Tea Party budget passed by the House could not be more stark and heartless. What does it say about their priorities and values when the very first programs they go after include a billion dollar cut to the program that provides nutrition assistance to pregnant mothers, infants, and young children? What does it say when one of the first things they cut is funding for community action agencies serving the most vulnerable in our society? What does it say when the first people they target for cuts are the children, seniors, sick, people with disabilities? Friends, this is exactly the wrong way to bring deficits under control. The right way is a balanced approach. Yes, we can take some spending cuts, but not just on discretionary spending. That's what they're going after, just discretionary spending. <laughs> discretionary spending makes only 12% of the entire budget. And yet they want to balance the budget on the backs of that discretionary spending, most of which goes to, again, the most vulnerable citizens in our society. Well, the best way, I say, is, well, we'll take some cuts in discretionary spending. We can all belly up to the bar, as they say. But how about some cuts in mandatory spending, and how about raising revenues that we need for our society? I have a modest suggestion. How about we begin with ending the Bush tax breaks for the wealthiest 2% of Americans? The wealthiest 2% of Americans don't need it, and we can't afford it. So people say, okay, Harkin, you're a senior appropriator. What spending do you want to cut? Well, all right, I'll bear my soul. How about bringing the troops home from Afghanistan and Iraq and saving all that money? <laughs> Cost $2,000 a day to keep one soldier in Afghanistan. This year will be about $166 billion. The entire $700 million we spend on CSBG is what we spend in about 18 hours in the war in Afghanistan. And as even if we're cut, as we're cutting spending overall and raising revenues, again, we've got to make room for critical investments in education, job training, yes, infrastructure, research, all the things that are really essential to economic expansion and growth, and also to have jobs for our young people in the future. Well, the House made their priorities and tensions clear. In the coming weeks, they'll ramp up their assault on CSBG and other safety net programs. So my friends, the battle is joined. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I'm ready for the fight. I'm ready for that fight. David, so are we, and I can tell that. As chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee, I'm determined to do everything in my power to protect CSBG and other programs. I know I'm not alone. We've heard from the Tea Party crowd. Now it's our turn to speak up and to fight for our true values in America. I've often spoken about what I consider those values to be and what our cardinal obligations are as Americans. You see, I have this philosophy. I may have spoken about it for you, but what the heck? Let me talk about it again. See, I, there's nothing wrong with, with having a better life in America, getting a better education, having a better job, making more money, having a nice car, vacation, nice clothes, sending your kids to good schools, having a good retirement. That's a big part of the American dream, isn't it? It sure is. And I feel it very intently. So I come from a family where neither, neither one of my parents went to college. My father was a coal miner most of his life. He only went to the eighth grade. Well, he said he went to the eighth grade. We later found out he only went to the sixth grade. <laughs> but he was Irish. He bragged a lot. <laughs> my mother was an immigrant. 
came to this country in steerage. I still have the, I have the documents from the SS Argentina that she came over to this country in, in steerage. With just enough money and a suitcase to get her to a place called Spring Hill, Iowa. So we were raised in a small house, in a small town as you know. If it hadn't been for, well I didn't, we didn't have Pell Grants in those days and we didn't have TRIO programs and we didn't have a lot of the things that all of you people work on. Um, so I was able to go to college because of uh, a military. I was an ROTC. So I went to school, I got ROTC, paid my way through Iowa State, went in the military. After the military, I got the GI Bill. The GI Bill put me through law school. So I want to thank all you taxpayers for my education. <laughs> But I've always believed very deeply that when you make it to the top, and you make it to the top, and you make it up, and you make it to the top, and when I make it to the top, primary responsibility of our government is to make sure we leave the ladder down for others to climb to. Now, mind you, I always talk about a ladder <clears throat> of opportunity. I didn't say an escalator, did I? <laughs> a lot of times we progress these, we get, our less liberals, we get talked about, oh, you just want to give everything to everybody. No, that's not so. You see, with the ladder, you still have to exert energy and effort and initiative to get to the top. But the rungs got to be there. And what are those rungs? Oh, things like women, infants, and children's feeding programs maternal and child health care programs, early childhood education, Head Start programs, decent public schools, making sure you got enough heat for the winter time and cooling in the summer, making sure that you have the ability to go to college without a mountain of debt hanging over your head. Those are the rungs on the ladder. And sometimes people climbing that ladder fall off. Many times through no fault of their own, an illness, an injury. And that's why we have safety nets to catch people, get them back up again. Work retraining, job retraining programs to get people going again. <clears throat> disability insurance to cover people with disabilities, a safety net. Now, 20 some years ago, Actually, I guess it's been almost 30 now. We looked around the country and found that there, were, there was a group of Americans, no matter how hard they tried, could never climb that ladder. People with disabilities. No matter how hard they tried, they never did that ladder. So we built a ramp of opportunity, and we called it the Americans with Disabilities Act, to give them their civil rights so that they could have an opportunity. And so, these ramps, I remember people said, oh, you can't pass that bill. You mean we're going to have to have buses with lifts, theaters with seating so people can get in? We're going to have sports, we're going to have to knock all those curb cuts in and all that, that crazy stuff? Well, yeah, but there's one thing I wanted to point out. There's not one nickel, not one dime in that bill. <clears throat> that has my name on it, the Americans with Disabilities Act, not one dime in there goes to a person with disabilities. We just knock down the barriers. Knock down the barriers. Provide a level playing field, and then tell people to go for it. So that's what, that's what we feel are the real, true, I feel are the true values of America, and what we fight for. That's what we need to be about as a nation. Not these mean-spirited actions that we're seeing today People taking meat axe approaches to programs serving the neediest, dividing us up, dividing us up, pitting one group against another. Instead of dividing people and pushing the poor and the cold, we need to recognize one fundamental value. We are one family, and yes, we are our brother's keeper. One last thing, as I have grown during my career, 
rub shoulders with the mighty and the powerful and the rich, the wealthy. There's one thing that I have become acutely aware of, that those who have considerable wealth, those that got to the top have. They have a network. They have a wonderful network that sort of keeps them at the top and keeps their children moving up at the top. How else would you explain a high school student with a C average getting into Yale University? <laughs> Unless maybe he had a network, like maybe his dad was president of the United States <laughs> and his grandfather was a senator. Yeah, he had a network. But for poor people, the kind of people I come from, those parents who were poor and didn't go to college, they only have one network. It's called government. And when you tear down that government, you destroy their only network. You destroy their ability to get a good education and a better life. When that C student I just mentioned was campaigning to become president a decade ago, I remember him saying again and again, I'll never forget, he said, government can't give hope to people. That was one of his stock lines. Government can't give hope to people. Nonsense. Of course government can give hope to people. It's just a question of who gets the hope. <laughs> Believe me, in the last decade, the defense industry has gotten a lot of hope. <laughs> Wall Street bankers, a lot of hope. Pharmaceutical companies have gotten a lot of hope. High income taxpayers, boy, they've gotten a lot of hope too. Thank you to the government. Well, you and I believe in giving hope to people who really need it and deserve it. Hardworking people who have lost their jobs, children growing up in poverty, single moms who are starting to get decent health care for their kids, people who have trouble paying their utility bills in winter. You in this room, you give these people hope. You give them boots, sometimes literally boots, so they can pull themselves up. You give them the rungs on that ladder and that ramp of opportunity. The work you do, I believe, is just about the most important work I can imagine in our country. I'm proud to be your partner. I'm proud to fight by your side to protect our community services programs. And I just want to let you know that this fight is going to be joined. We're not going to back down. We're not going to back up. We will join together. We'll speak with one voice and fight power with truth. And in the end, the truth will prevail. And it's because of you. Here in this room, when you go back to your states and you let people know what's happening, they will rise up. And they will be our new civil rights movement in this new decade to make sure that the government continues to provide that network for the poorest people in this country. That's why I'm so proud to be here. That's why I'm so proud to be your partner. And that's why I look forward to the fight and being on your side, because it's a fight we are going to win. Thank you.